and participants. With great joy and immense pleasure, I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all for the third phase of AACT-sponsored short-term training program on paradigm shift in the assessment and evaluation practices for engineering graduates scheduled from 7th to 12th December 2020, organized by the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, Amal Jodi College of Engineering. For none of us achieves anything in life without God's grace. Let us begin the inaugural session with a silent prayer. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more and do more and become more, you are a leader. Of more than 35 years of R&D experience and retired as senior director and scientist G at CDAC, Dr. Z. V. Lakaparambu, the principal of Amaljodi College of Engineering is cordially invited for the welcome address. Good morning all, honorable VC of KTU, our manager, organizers on and off dias, expert speakers, dear participants, a very good morning to you all. Paradigm shift in evaluation assessment practices of engineering graduates will be conducted from today to 12th of this month. It's the third phase of activity on an HTTP sponsored by AACT. The aims of any professional education in engineering has to reflect the current needs of a society as well as its lasting values and the immediate concerns of the community along with a broad understanding of human values. The assessment measures its intended purpose. Government of India has announced the new NEP 2020, the national education policy for the country. The emphasis on quality in education is a well discussed topic through this document. Technology has played a big role in increasing the productivity of students. The use of multimedia in education has reduced wastage of time, energy, and money while encouraging and rewarding hard work. During this pandemic period, educators and learners experimented with the online mechanism in a massive way, which will irreversibly continue to become a part of our educational system. Nowadays, technology is playing a major role in assessing the quality of education. Now I will come to my basic duty. We are honored to have the presence of Professor Dr. M.S. Rajasri, the Honorable VC of APJ Abdul Kalam Technological University to which we are affiliated. Professor M.S. Rajasri has a successful professional career before taking up the charge as, as the prestigious position as Vice Chancellor of KTU. I take this opportunity, opportunity to formally welcome Professor Dr. M.S. Rayasri, the Honorable VC of APJ Abdullah Kalam Technological University to inaugurate this function. Welcome, Madam. Our beloved manager, Reverend Dr. Matthew Paikat, is a general educationalist having modern views on education and, and is guiding our activity. Agreed to preside over this function. I formally welcome Reverend Dr. Manager. I also welcome Reverend Dr. James Elanjipuram, who will introduce our Honorable VC. Dr. Teresa Emina Mahesh is the coordinator for this event and will be briefing us on the objectives of this HTTP. I formally welcome Dr. Teresa Emina. Also extend a warm welcome to Professor K.G. Sadish Kumar, the HOD of the host department for this HTTP. Learning is enjoyable and this dissimulating knowledge gives satisfaction. We have a pool of external expert teachers who deliver their knowledge in the special domain on education. On behalf of the organizers and on my behalf, I welcome each and every one of our expert speakers. Participants have joined us with great enthusiasm to learn. On behalf of Amal Jodi College of Engineering and on my behalf, I welcome each and every one of you and wish you all a good time. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. 
I invite Dr. Therese Yamna Mahesh, Associate Professor and Course Coordinator of the SDPP to specify the objective of the training program. Most honored Chief Guest, Dr. M. S. Rajasri, Vice Chancellor of APJ Abdul Kalam Technological University, Respected Manager, Reverend Dr. Matthew Paikart, Respected Principal, Dr. S. V. Lakaparambal, Reverend Father James Elanjipuram, Dean Basic Skills and Welfare, Professor Sadish Kumar, HOD ECE, heads of the various departments, and my dearest invitees. After a span of several decades of mark-based education, now we have realized the need that the engineers who graduate from our colleges should be skilled professionals, as the society demands a lot on, depends a lot on engineers. With the advent of the new education policy, the concept of creativity seems to become increasingly important. Innovation depends on creative ideas. So the need of innovative solutions in a globalized world puts creativity in focus. Engineers who embody the creative inventors more than any other occupational group carry an important contribution to solving current problems. This is reflected in program outcome six of NBA, that is engineer and society. However, engineering education has not known to be particularly creative. So here comes the need for outcome-based education and a paradigm shift in the assessment techniques. We are thankful to AICT for sanctioning us the short-term training program in three phases. The phase one of the STTP was purely for understanding the program outcomes. We had exceptional resource persons from the academia and industry who had proved the outcomes in their career and almost all of them were above 65 years of age. Phase two was on the theme NEP and need for accreditation in engineering colleges. And we found that all the resource persons were in the age group of 40 to 60 years. Phase three discusses modern tool usage for education and assessment. And it was interesting to note that most of the speakers are youngsters. This proves that implementation of the theory put forward by the wise in the upper age category will be implemented by the youngsters. One of the attributes to be developed in the graduating engineer is program outcome five of NBA, that is the modern tool usage. This is achieved through an initial attempt to understand the usage of the tool, apply it to comprehend concepts in suitable courses, and finally use the tool to apply, formulate, design, implement, and demonstrate a self-defined task. This is the main aim of this, uh, this phase of the HTTP, and we have valuable sessions on virtual reality tools, design thinking tools, Canva app, Licks, and a lot more. It's heartening to see that the assessment tactics are changing and challenging the status quo. And frankly, it can't happen that fast enough with the growth of technology and it being integrated into the classroom at all levels. There seems to be many shifts happening in the assessment paradigm as teachers and students alike have new tools to utilize and help that help them teach and learn. It will be interesting to see how it all evolves in the coming years. The lockdown has accelerated adoption of digital technology. This is an ideal time to experiment and deploy new tools to make education delivery meaningful to students who can't go to campuses. It's a chance to be more efficient and productive while developing new and improved professional skills through online learning and assessment. We all know engineering contributes to 60% of exports in India, and the GDP of industry contributes 20, 23%, 23%. The contribution from industry is ranked sixth in the world, according to the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, 2018-19. In the AICT sustainability initiatives, AICT envisions that engineers graduating from the affiliating institutions are made responsible citizens of the world and are responsible towards environmental concerns with the usage of modern tools. 
Hence the need for us to be updated with the modern tools is of prime importance. Seeking the blessings of all for the successful conduct of this program and hoping that the discussions in the coming week will be useful <coughs> for our profession, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. We feel honored to have with us Father Dr. Matthew Pikart, Manager, Amal Jodi College of Engineering, the man of distinct vision, an idol of knowledge and experience, and inspiration to all of us to preside over the function. Uh, today's chief guest, Professor Dr. Rajasri Emers, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of KTU, who inaugurates uh, this STTP. Uh, Dr. Isadvi Lagaparambil, our principal. Reverend Dr. James Elenjipuram, Dean Basic Skills and Welfare, Amal Jodi. Professor K.G. Sadish Kumar, HOD, E.C. Amal Jodi. Dr. Therese Yamina Mahesh, coordinator of this STTP. Eminent speakers and my dear participants. A warm greetings to all. It gives, gives me great pleasure to be a part of this inaugural ceremony of the phase three of AICT sponsored short term training program on paradigm shift in assessment and evaluation practices of engineering graduates. Organized by the Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering of our college. We are honored to have with us Dr. Rajasri Emers, Vice Chancellor, Abdul Kalam Technological University, Trivandrum, as chief guest for the inaugural session of phase three. We were blessed to have Dr. Preeti Bajaj, Vice Chancellor, Galgothias University, to inaugurate phase one and Dr. Sabu Thomas, Vice Chancellor, Mahatma Gandhi University for the inauguration of phase two of the STTP. I wish this program would have been an offline one, giving an opportunity for us to host you all in our magnificent campus. 22 resource persons have delivered their sessions in the online mode during the last two STTPs, and 12 eminent speakers will be sharing their knowledge in phase three of the STTP. My best wishes to the participants and the resource persons. My congratulations to the course coordinator, Dr. Therese Yabna Mahesh, for bringing the funded STTP to the campus for designing the STTP contents and inviting the resource persons. My wishes uh, to the program coordinators, Mr. Jason Sears, Ms. Renchida Rajan, Ms. Inthur Reena Vargis, and the Department of EZE, headed by Professor K.G. Sadish Kumar for organizing this event updating ourselves with the right knowledge and technology is the need of the hour. So once again, I thank Dr. Rajasri Emers, our Vice Chancellor for accepting our invitation to enhance the knowledge of members of faculty who are from all over the country. Asking God's blessings, I remain. Thank you very much, thank you. Thank you, Father. I now welcome Reverend Father James Ilanipuram, Dean Basic Skills and Wef Welfare, Amal Jodi College of Engineering, to introduce the Chief Guest. Respected President of the Function, Reverend Father Dr. Matthew Weikart, our Manager, Chief Guest of the Day, Honorable Vice Chancellor Dr. M.S. Rajasri, our Principal Dr. Sidvi Lagaparambil, Professor Kaji Sadesh Kumar, HODEC, Professor Yamina Therese, the coordinator of the STTP, distinguished guests and participants. As we stand at the beginning of the third and final phase of the STTP, organized by the Department of EC Amal Jodi College, 
it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce the chief guest of the day the honorable vice chancellor of ktu dr ms rajasri we are always challenged to invent and augment new methods and paradigms in education and to look for new normals is the need of the hour especially so as we live amid the covid-19 pandemic situation this http is aimed at investigating the paradigm shift in assessment and evaluation in the engineering discipline being at the helm of affairs of this technical university dr rajasri is the apt person to inaugurate this final phase of the http she is a vice chancellor of our university and needs no introduction however let me take a quick glance at some of the major achievements in her academic career dr rajasri joined us vice chancellor of the apj abdul kalam technical university in 2019 with a long teaching career of 28 years she has also served as principal government engineering college barton hill and as director indian institute of information technology kolikkad she has also served the academic community in various capacities as teacher researcher and has taken up leadership in curriculum design conduct of examinations and introducing new pg programs her research interests include distributed and object oriented software engineering cloud computing and pattern recognition she has guided six phd students and has to her credit several research papers including 17 in international journals and 18 in international conferences she had her btech from nit calicut and mtech and phd from iit madras and her area of specialization is computer science and engineering she has been granted several awards some of them e governance award for best e learning solution instituted by the institute of management in government and she has won the aict scholarship for mtech and phd programs and she is the fourth rank holder in the university for the btech program and has won the merit scholarship for pre degree and btech and this morning she will be talking to us on shaping the culture of engineering the rise of obe outcome based education is the current catchword in the educational sector and we are fortunate to have such an eminent scholar to address the issue on behalf of the amal jodi family i now request dr rajasri to take over and inaugurate the third phase of the stdp and deliver the inaugural lecture thank you very good morning to one and all most respected a uh, principal a uh, president of the function and manager uh, reverend father matthew paikart dean reverend father james head of the department of ec dr dr uh, Sat satish kumar coordinator of this magnificent uh, training program Uh, dr uh, teresa faculty members heads of the department deans research scholars and students eminent personalities from other uh, educational and research institutions who is giving sessions in this program and participants of this workshop so it is very wonderful to see that uh, the The, such a program is uh, being organized by uh, amal jyoti uh, college of engineering this is something we all talk about now outcome based education paradigm shift in assessment etc so from the the time uh, has come when we started changing conversation so we all are aware that no profession unleashes the spirit of uh, engineering and mm -hmm. as it 
it is from research to real life applications engineers constantly keep on discovering new things which improves the quality of life of people create solutions and connect science to life that is what is more important and this connection is being established in magnificent ways very unexpected and very forward thinking ways so there are only few professions which turn so many ideas into so many solutions and only few of them have impact on people's everyday lives we are counting on engineers and their imaginations to help us meet the challenges of the 21st century and that is where we embrace outcome based education as one as one of the uh, solutions for for producing promising engineers who are capable of changing this uh, conversation now we see that ob is the thing and we design our curriculum based on that and it is only one aspect of it and the most important aspects also lie in pedagogy and evaluation method and that is exactly what uh, the the theme of this session is addressing which is very significant so when we uh, think of producing engineers if we if we consider uh, an engineering graduate as a product and if we look at say manufacturing sector we look at pro we we define the quality attributes that product should have and we control our processes to see that the products come out of the uh, the, the the manufacturing process are with uh, satisfy all the requirements and are with zero defects but see i was just trying to put an analogy with the education engineering education where we adopt such a process we we come up with a very well defined uh, curriculum which we claim to be outcome based and then we define uh, attributes and we have very beautiful ways of linking attributes outcomes uh, attributes and outcomes and then with the contents and then curriculum and we try to map everything and put it across and then we believe that the, see there's no way to believe that it will be as defined and as clear as a manufacturing process where such things can be defined and the product can be ensured of this quality so there are differences when we deal with students and it has to be dealt in a very different way when we think of uh, think of having mechanisms to see that the outcomes are achieved and this becomes highly personalized it's not only with respect to the student it is also to do with the institutions which deliver the program several other factors which which we some of which we have control and some of which we do not absolutely have uh, control so this makes it very complicated and when we look at assessment or evaluation techniques to measure these outcomes in a clear way to see that obe uh, obe objectives are assigned it becomes a very hard exercise and that is exactly what this uh, uh, this uh, session is uh, uh, going to address so it's very very interesting to see that this is something uh, th this will open up several insights as to how we should be uh, tuning or how sh we should be fundamentally changing the evaluation processes and it is also interesting to note that you are linking uh, the uh, very versatile national uh, education policy nep 2020 that has just come up and also uh, the modern tool usage so this becomes a very uh, apt combination because we know that uh, nep puts a lot of emphasis on higher education which uh, which uh, uh, em emphasize emphasizes to see that the education 
leads to creative and all rounded individuals so the every words each and every word in those descriptions are put very carefully and with very profound meanings and then there is also a linkage with life where humanities and social sciences are also given uh, uh, also given uh, importance in the uh, in the uh, technical uh, education uh, higher, higher education uh, higher education and uh, in general and technical education in particular so that is when we link to what i told in the beginning that we are the ones uh, who come up with innovative solutions which touch the life of Re, uh, touch the life of people and we come up with uh, solutions which uh, peop uh, people uh, look at every day so that is when it becomes significant and it is a responsibility to see that uh, the the graduates are capable of looking at the problem and the solution in a holistic way and come up with solutions for that so uh, the uh, when uh, dr teresa introduced the concept Uh, of this uh, this uh, uh, webinar as such uh, she was uh, putting engineer and society so it is not very easy for us to put engineer and society as some contents in the uh, syllabus and then explain with details how this can happen and all but it is not that way it is something which has to come in in, a, in an experiential way if we look at a problem in the context of one specific region and solve it there the engineer the societal problems that the engineer will have to address will be substantially different from the way it is addressed in a different region even in the state of kerala if we look at it that way so that is where it becomes so uh, contextual and uh, regionally relevant what are the kind of uh, problems that the engineer uh, needs to address in or what are the issues that one needs to address when solving a particular a specific a single problem in two different social uh, scenarios so these are all very critical and it is not something which any whether those uh, those concept or whether this philosophy has gone into the children this can be evaluated only through very specific means which needs to Uh, needs to be uh, tailor made to the context as well so what i'm trying to uh, bring out is that it is not as simple as we think when we look at assessment and evaluation schemes to suit to outcome based education and linking it with the basic uh, propositions of the policy which is supposed to bring out holistic uh, problem solvers for the society to address the problems that the society faces with creative Uh, solutions which are uh, which are uh, integrated with uh, innovative ideas so a lot of things are coming in and th th that is where we need to be very careful when we assess these kind of skills in students so we all uh, we 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 all uh, accept that uh, engineering is all about uh, uh, the uh, knowledge plus skills uh, plus the attitude and all these have to be Uh, individually assess to see that the outcomes are uh, achieved and then it is fundamentally uh, see some of the things uh, with um, with modern tools and everything some of the things can uh, be automated and captured uh, for example i i, I just try to uh, see that uh, uh, if we are able to uh, look at uh, the bloom's uh, taxonomy and then classify the uh, the question such that uh, Uh, the the specific the specific uh, uh, levels of uh, understanding of a particular subjects if uh, it can be tagged with the question papers and if uh, the artificial intelligence based solution can come up with the right mix of all these uh, learning levels we can have we can come up with a question paper to 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 some extent to address that where the modern tools come in but it when it comes to uh, some uh, execution of a project where we assess some other skills uh which 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 needs to be assessed then how exactly that skill is being imparted uh, uh, can be assessed only with a different framework 
So this opens up or this makes the problem a little more complex. It's not the conventional examination that matters or it is not the conventional laboratory exercises also with specific exercises and given resources and um, say time if the students are able to do it. That, that, is all, that also becomes a kind of deterministic. Uh, so so it, it, it is something very exciting to look at these kind of solutions. And I believe the deliberations that, we, the deliberations that you have you are going to have in the uh, coming days will 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 take into account all these considerations for example if you, if you look at the listed attributes and then uh, look at each one of them and see uh, in a specific context, uh, context in the sense, if you take a particular uh, particular subject and then uh, then then you see how uh, these can be evaluated using that subject, and you also take a group of subjects and then based on the knowledge components that is extracted from all these subjects, are you able to come up with the project? And is, is that project capable of assessing some of the attributes? And how much of this assessment uh, will have to be done in a, in, a, in a generic way? How much of it uh, becomes uh, dependent on the environment in which the, pro, uh, the project is executed? So it is, uh, if, if you think of a framework for assessing all these, it becomes very complicated. And I, I, I believe that this is going to be a long-term exercise to come up with uh, a single solution for all these, but we can always have some scientific ways by which these assessments can be made, and then uh, the 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 uh, derive with tangible means by which this can be assessed. So when whenever we talk of uh, assessment uh, from see from the uh, earlier way in which the knowledge was evaluated and assessed, we are gradually shifting from it. And we always, the, the goal is to have as much as quantitative assessment as possible to make the assessment very objective. So that is where we all end up. And then once we have framework for this sort of assessment, how well we can bring in the quantitative specifications in and how this can be linked with the framework uh, framework and how this quantitative parameters can be uh, uh, connected to the the uh, attributes. So th this is not a trivial trivial problem. So this is this is something that educators need to work on, and this to a large extent depends on the the stream in which we are putting this the stream of engineering it will be very different for uh, a mechanical engineering problem it will be very different for a computing problem and when it when, when it becomes an interdisciplinary kind of problem or a project that is being assessed this becomes a little more different so uh, see th these are all some interesting ways in which uh, the paradigm shift uh, can be looked at and then see most, what is the most tangible way this can be addressed. That is what one, one should be looking at and what is the easiest way in which such, a, such an assessment model can be experimented uh, to a collection of subjects or uh, see, we always talk about project-based uh, project learning where we apply the knowledge uh, and, and plus skills to do some projects and then how, uh, how far these projects achieve this goal in assessing, uh, assessing children to measure the capabilities that they have uh, capabilities, uh, those capabilities that have been built into them. So these are all some open questions I'm, I'm, I throw, uh, I'm throwing open to all the people who are part of uh, uh, this uh, webinar uh, series, this FDP, because there are large number of teachers uh, and uh, research scholars, I believe, uh, who are part of this, uh, uh, this, this exercise. And it will be very uh, good for them uh, to think about this and apply it uh, from in their own context. When I say their own context, there will be teachers who are specialized in specific areas, specific streams, and the, the, the way they are solving problems also will be different. Some of them will be mostly depending on experimental work to solve uh, problems or then uh, teach subjects. And some of them may be using simulation techniques to solve uh, problems or uh, teach students for certain subjects. So it is a combination of all, all that. 
So all said and done, it is for us to see how well we can have a generic framework for assessment, which takes into consideration all, all these aspects and which suits best for the uh, evaluation of outcome-based approach. It's, it, it's very clear that the, the uh, modes that we follow, that is having an outcome-based uh, curriculum designed and then having a conventional uh, pedagogy and evaluation technique will not take us uh, anywhere. So the assessment, if we are discussing about the assessment, we need to definitely go back and see what, what is the, how, how best can this assessment be used uh, used in the present pe uh, pedagogy that is being followed? And what are the essential changes that we need to bring into the pedagogy to make this assessment suitable? So it, it is again uh, the, uh, 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 a connected problem, how the, the subjects are taught and then how you are evaluating that. If it is very theoretical and then you are having this sort of evaluation where you try to, uh, to, uh, try to assess the skills and uh, their uh, capabilities of uh, solving problems in or pro uh, doing projects or look at very open problems, then that, that, that doesn't suit. So all these are interconnected and we have to have integrated framework for, uh, for, for putting all these three in perspective, your outcome-based uh, curriculum, then the pedagogical approaches and the evaluation techniques. And only that will yield us a, a holistic approach to having the, 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 the purpose realized. So that, that, that is my uh, take on this. And then uh, one, one thing is very clear that uh, in order to be uh, creative and in order to be uh, generating real problem solvers who are able to apply the uh, knowledge that have been learned and who have been able to innovate uh, and exercise creativity to look at problems afresh and solve them. So that if, if we are looking at uh, such a transformation in the uh, education, then definitely all these will have to go uh, in, a, in a synergistic way. Only then we can have those uh, attributes assigned and it requires very fundamental changes in the whole model and very fundamental changes in the capabilities of faculty members. That is also very critical. One who is not very much used to this kind of uh, doing and then it, it is only teaching and learning and if everything stops there, then it just becomes hard for us to have these sort of approaches. So it is it, it demands change uh, in everything, the, cap the capabilities that needs to be built into the faculty members, how they can handle the uh, subject in a, in a very different way and how they can evaluate. And the students also should be, uh, made, uh, made, made, uh, should be made clearly uh, aware as to what, 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 are, what are the factors or what are the, uh, the capabilities that are expected of them at the end of the program to solve this. And all this requires an end-to-end -end, uh, approach from the, uh, the uh, design of the curriculum uh, to the evaluation uh, to see that uh, the, the goals are achieved. Because we, we clearly, it's only that, it's not only that we clearly define the goals and outcomes and then have very haphazard ways of putting it and then uh, putting it on, uh, see, black and white, it doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't help us too much, so much. And it should, be, it should be by truly assessing the individuals who have uh, come through this program and through the, the, the novel approaches. And then it is the assessment of those individuals and then uh, the, the feedback to the whole uh, process to improve it, to address the gaps, whether it is uh, in, the, uh, in the curriculum or whether it is in the way it is uh, uh, delivered to the students and then whether it is the, see, the, the difficulties can come uh, everywhere. It can be with the curriculum, it can be with the pedagogy, it can also be with the assessment. So it is, it is I would like to put it as an iterative process where, the, where, uh, where it has to go through several iterations to refine, uh, to see that the whole uh, components are put in, all the three components are put in place. And I request uh, the, uh, the experts who are uh, looking at this uh, problem, looking for a fundamental, a philosophical change, as you call it, as a paradigm shift 
to, to see it from its basic way and having uh, case studies with uh, case studies in all branches of engineering and also uh, in relation to the uh, modern tools and techniques that are existing uh, to, to see that we come up with a holistic recommendation for this. I, I love to see some solid recommendations coming out of this uh, webinar because it is very intensive and it is very, uh, very, very thoughtful uh, that uh, such a theme is uh, being, being brought out in this deliberations, uh, which is the key thing for us to, uh, you know, for us to believe that we are subscribing to the fundamental philosophy of uh, outcome-based education. And it is also very nice to see that uh, the, 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 the prescriptions uh, in the uh, policy also resonates the approach that have been uh, uh, followed by us a few years, uh, from, since a few uh, year, uh, years back itself in the Abbott's model of accreditation that uh, uh, this, this scheme is being followed. Uh, so, uh, so everything, uh, see, see, one is uh, like strengthening the other and uh, it should evolve that way with the advent of new tools and techniques. It is, uh, it is not from the tools that it should start, but fundamentally we should see how exactly the, the objectives can be, uh, objectives or the outcomes of the stated objectives can be clearly assessed using techniques proposed and how it can be uh, supported with adequate tools. Uh, so the tool usage can be in the whole process. It can be in the uh, in the delivery of the uh, curriculum. In uh, see, in some of the cases, uh, the tools tools will be helpful for students to uh, learn the concepts and for them to experiment and for them to practice if they have learned or not. And in 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 some cases, simulations will be useful for them to see that the learning has happened. And uh, so, so that the tool usage comes everywhere. And also we can think of uh, uh, such tools, which is uh, uh, set for the entire framework, which brings, uh, uh, brings such uh, processes of evaluation, mapping, et cetera, using this. With the advent of new uh, digital uh, technologies, like uh, digital technologies and digital uh, solutions powered by artificial intelligence and all, it becomes very easy for uh, coming up with assessment mechanisms to uh, see the, the, the learner's uh, capabilities, uh, learner's capabilities, say, before the session and after the session. So uh, I, I am not uh, trying to tell you that the whole thing can be automated, but there are some components which if carefully drawn, uh, which can be part of the framework, which can be automated. And some of the things are very, uh, have to be very subjectively evaluated by knowledgeable teachers, a team of teachers, a team of uh, uh, professionals with interdisciplinary expertise. And uh, see, again, connecting to the society, how, how, it, how it exactly matches this with the needs of the, uh, the, the people around and, and, and uh, several other things. So if we take each one of the attributes, there will be several dimensions from which uh, this, can be, uh, this can be detailed and worked out when it, when it comes to the assessment of each one of this. And it is going to be a very magnificent exercise as faculty members who have passion in doing this, they can always uh, keep this itself as a research and involve their people, their research scholars in to look at a few problems on this to see how uh, technical education can be improved with uh, uh, newer, uh, newer and novel strategies for uh, evaluation and assessment techniques. And this is something that uh, many institutes uh, uh, are working on now, uh, teachers training institutes and uh, all over the world, this is being deliberated upon and there will be very interesting uh, assessment mechanisms. So people are even uh, thinking of um, coming up with competency framework where the, the students' uh, competencies are mapped to a uh, a, a certain framework where the, uh, the, the, uh, the capabilities or the skills that have to be brought in can be classified into several levels and then it is mapped to each of these and uh, not, not merely a resume, but a competency score at the end of the uh, program 
will becomes a, a very rich portfolio which can be used to assess the student at the end of the program there are very interesting developments like this happening across the world and i call upon all the participants to be open to these and uh, look at all these in a holistic way uh, thus being able to uh, come up with uh, very very uh, good solutions for solutions and techniques for assessment and evaluations which uh, which very uh, genuinely or very organically links with the outcome based education curriculum uh, uh, i i uh, i think uh, uh, i haven't uh, uh, I, i mean i haven't spoken too many things and uh, uh, confused but i i i i was trying to tell you some fundamental things i and uh, i think uh, it would have gone in in the right sense and it will uh, kindle some thoughts in you uh, to see that uh, we are uh, able to uh, come up with some uh, good things to work on further and come up with very uh, very profound solutions which can become uh, part of the entire Uh, teaching learning process uh, in the university as well so such recommendations are always welcome and let us see how we can further work on this as a team thank you very much for giving this opportunity i am very happy to learn that uh, the the connected three teams have been uh, put in the right perspective uh, uh, in this uh, fdp and lot of teachers across the country are going to benefit out of the deliberations here i thank uh, the amal jodi team for this opportunity uh, the principal management and all the senior uh, members of the leadership and uh, dr teresa in particular for uh, following up with me and uh, making me part of this thank you thank you one and all uh, have a nice day thank you madam most cordially i now invite professor k g satish kumar head of the electronics and communication engineering department to deliver the vote of thanks reverend dr mathew paikat president of the function honorable vice chancellor professor dr m s rajasree dr sir vilaga parmil principal of the college reverend dr james alnipuram dr teresa imra mahesh all dear participants a warm good mornings to one and all with honor and pride i stand before you to extend the vote of thanks on the inaugural ceremony of third phase of six day act sponsored sttp on paradigm shift in the assessment and evaluation practices of engineering graduates even in the busiest schedule our honorable vice chancellor has accepted our invitation and inaugurated the function with emphasis on outcome based education mam Ma has put some questions to us for discussing and implementing it at our different levels with most respectfully i extend wholehearted thanks to our honorable vice chancellor dr ms rajasree on the behalf of ajc family and on the behalf of all the participants thank you thank please you. kindly thank accept thank you so much ma thank you i extend my sincere thanks to our beloved manager reverend dr mathew paikat for all the supports and presiding over the functions on behalf of the all those who are attending the function father kindly accept it my sincere thanks to dr sadvil agaparambil our principal for his able guidance and inspiration i extend sincere thanks on the behalf of the entire participants and on my behalf my sincere thanks to reverend dr james alnipuram dean basic skills and welfare ajc for introducing the chief guest and uh, throwing all the aspects of our training program father kindly accept my sincere thanks my colleague dr dresa emna mahesh this paradigm shift the theme was her ideas she was meticulously planning and implementing these three phases dear mom kindly accept my sincere thanks i also would like to extend my sincere thanks to all the participants listeners and organizing team once again thank you all i remain thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you shall i leave now yeah no problem thank you thank you now we come to the end of the session thank you all dignitaries for joining next session will start at 11 am back to the next session uh, let me invite dr teresa yavana mahesh 
coordinator of this program for introducing the resource person. Good morning and very warm welcome to all of you. Let me introduce Sri Jayadev Menon to all of you. Sri Jayadev Menon is the chief executive of us, us, AS, AKSH People Transformation. He is a consultant, mentor, and trainer with over 36 years of professional experience. This consultancy is in the 13th year of operation. Earlier, Mr. Menon worked for 24 years with leading Indian companies in the office equipment and telecom sectors. As the chief executive of AKSH, People Transformation, he has trained managers, business owners, teachers, and students. Leadership development, creative thinking, design thinking and sales are his, are his focus areas. He has delivered talks, conducted lectures and training programs at many leading professional colleges in Kerala too. So is an active blogger and public speaker. He has written close to 300 articles at a blog titled Sales Coach, Coach Blog. Articles written by him appear regularly in Dunham Business Magazine and FWD Business Magazine. He has delivered talks at National Institute of Personal Management, National HRD Network, Indian Society for Technical and Development and National Conference of Realtors. He was a member of the Faculty Development Committee and Management Competition Committee of Kerala Management Association. Sir doesn't miss any opportunity to guide and mentor the future leaders of Kerala. We thank you very much, sir, for coming over to take the session at a very short notice and we welcome you to this session. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Theresa Mena. So it's, a, it's my pleasure uh, to be a part of this, you know, uh, high quality program that has been planned for AICT teachers. And uh, you told me that there are teachers from all across India yes. in this program. Um, I thank the principal of the college and the manager and management committee and you for giving me this opportunity to make a small presentation. Um, can the teachers hear me? You can just respond by putting a yes in the chat box. If I'm not clear at any point, uh, you can let me know and I shall speak louder. And I know that there are teachers from all across India, so I shall limit myself to speaking in English uh, because many of you may not probably understand my mother tongue, which is Malayalam. So can I hear some response? In the, uh, is the chat permitted? Uh, Jason, earlier chat was not being permitted. So yeah, can you en enable chat? chat? Yeah, chat, it's enabled now, is it? Yeah. Okay. So can I get some more response from all of you teachers? Right now you are in student mode. You're not in teacher mode for the next one hour. <laughs> so let's get an answer from some of you. No one? Okay, let's go ahead and I'll hope, uh, look forward to hearing from some of you as we go along. So we're going to talk in the next one hour uh, about how to make your online classes more interesting, online teaching. But first of all, what are the challenges and what are some of the strategies we can adopt in order to make the classes more interesting? I'll take, begin with giving some introduction to myself and the work that I do. Uh, I have worked with major clients across India and in Oman and Maldives. So many of the global giants are my class customers. So like uh, Dr. Yamuna already said, I do leadership development, management development, design thinking, creativity workshops, sales and customer service training programs. And of course, I've conducted classes at many uh, engineering and uh, MBA colleges, managed business schools, mainly in Kerala. So you have the Rajgiri and SCMS, St. Gitts, um, DC School. And these are some of the colleges where I've conducted sessions for the students and for teachers. Uh, I've done creativity workshops, design thinking workshops, career skills and so on. So these are some of the programs that I've done. Now let's come to the subject that we are going to deal with today. So from March onwards, the globe, uh, everyone across the globe and everything that we do across the globe uh, took a major uh, uh, turn for, you know, I don't know whether you can call it for the better or worse. And uh, let me grab something to show all of you. Something that 99.99% of us never used to wear when we go out we have to do this when we go out of the house, wear a mask, right? It's something that we are forced to do. And that causes its own set of issues and constraints. 
but we are learning we are coming to cope with it and learn to live with it and of course everything that we do now education or business or social interactions i can't remember ever in my life chatting with my family members on zoom but recently uh, we started doing that once a month just to keep in touch because a city i live in kochi in trivandrum is just 200 kilometers away uh, trichur is just 70 kilometers away i have never seen trichur in the last 7 8 months i went to trivandrum just once i have not got into a train in the last 7 8 months so a lot of changes education also had to undergo a huge change as a result of covid all of you started doing probably 99.99% of you started doing something that you have never done before we started using online platforms like zoom or microsoft team or google meet or one of the other platforms in order to deliver classes to your students and that brought its own set of challenges for all of you because we are all kind of used to doing business in person talking to people in person of course we did uh, some whatsapp chatting and all that or video chatting but that was only with friends casual uh, professionally we never used i don't know how many of you have used zoom or any other video platform uh, before covid uh, i know some people who have done so but i never did uh, i did attend one or two zoom platform meetings uh, earlier but just once in a year or something now we are doing it every day i am a part of a business networking group uh, i have regular meetings every day of the meet, uh, week uh, on zoom i conduct classes for a college in cochin again it's on zoom so you know, what are the challenges first of all before i come out with my own uh, set of challenges i would like to tell all of you that this session is going to be interactive i'd like all of you to because all of you are teachers many of you with decades of experience so i would like to hear from all of you what you are doing to make your classes interesting uh, before i share my idea so i'd like to have an interactive session it has to be collaborative so some of you will have a good idea which some others may not be using so you can share your ideas and uh, the other person can share what they are doing and it through by a collaborative method you can make your classes better than before uh, by getting inputs from each other third thing i would like to say is i would like to share some stories and i'd like you all i would like to suggest to all of you also to do storytelling because that's the best way we can teach uh, i'm i if i ask all of you uh, what is the you know what are the things that you remember from your childhood it will be usually not the classes that you went for but it will be what Uh, your grandmother or your mother or some or your father told you some interesting story or your teacher told you some interesting story in the classroom you will remember the class stories but you probably will not remember uh, the lessons you were probably learned in school and finally i'd like to have some experience sharing from all of you about how you did uh, to overcome hurdles uh, to conduct online classes uh, jason can you hear me yes sir Okay. Yes, Because I could suddenly not see the uh, Zoom uh, windows. Can hear you, sir. Huh? We can hear you. You can hear me. Perfect. Yes, sir. So going forward. Um, so, what are some of the challenges you are facing as teachers currently in the last seven months or eight months since COVID? Uh, what are some of the challenges you are facing? Can you one or two of you unmute yourself and tell me what are some of the challenges you are facing before I tell you what could be some of the challenges? Yamina, since you are um, uh, a teacher too, if you are there, why don't you st start with the challenge you faced? So, and that would be the starting point for others also. Anyone? Some interesting challenge you faced in your online classroom? If you if you uh, don't uh, have a, a story to tell me, you can type in your chat box also. has uh, has any instruction gone out to the teachers that you shouldn't speak i would i would love to have some response from some of you i'm waiting for your response because it's it's not fun if i just keep speaking with all of you i would like to hear from some of you nothing and i might just well continue because i can't hear anyone 
Uh, sir, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, one of the challenges that we faced was uh, we were not able to assess the students correctly. Understand? Assess, assess the students. Assess the students. Exam. Okay. Uh, probably the people who don't study well they get more marks. Okay. Because they are uh, open to uh, view the text and write the answer. Okay. Okay. So that is one problem. Assessment will not be correct okay. when we conduct online exams. And uh, okay. another thing is, we cannot uh, they really find out whether they are listening or not. They oh, can just uh, switch have, on, log in, and then uh, go somewhere. We will not be able to find out whether they are there. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think some of it is happening even right now. And so many of the classes that I've conducted also, the same thing happens. Students log in. Um, when I, I've conducted classes for 110 students, out of which about 15 students uh, will respond the remaining 90 people will not respond at all. So it's, it is a challenge. I agree with you. Uh, assessment, I do have an idea. Um, should I give an answer right now or should I hold it? Uh, I, let, since you asked the question, let me answer right away. Uh, you can have a concurrent assessment model where uh, you can give a practical problem in the class. So instead of just using an examination as an assessment, um, you can meaning the term end examination or you know uh, year end examination you can have concurrent examinations where while the session is going on you can call out students uh, and give them uh, give them a practical problem which should be included in your session and how they deal with that so uh, that problem uh, something that can, for which an answer cannot be found in a textbook if you can make it application oriented so even if they refer into the textbook, they will be only able to refer to a formula or you know a theorem or, or a, you know a logic. But they have to apply the logic or apply the formula, and then come with a find a solution to the problem. I, I have some um, solution uh, detailed solutions for that as we go along. But it's a very very valid question what Dr. Yamuna has asked, and uh, I know some of you are not some of you many of you are faced with this challenge. How to assess the student? So I'll show you when I come to that slide on some th my thoughts on how to assess students. Thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Ayamuna. Going forward, some of the challenges are, you know, we ourselves uh, lacking motivation to conduct the session. What is happening is today I have 85 people uh, listening to me. But I don't see, I, I, I mean, excluding me, 83 people, but not one of them can be seen by me. I can see a lot of dark screens here. Everyone is in the background. I don't know whether they are there or not, but in spite of that, I need to deliver my program with maximum energy and with maximum motivation because that energy is what is one of the key requirements in making your session successful. Even if you are in a classroom session, if you deliver the session in a very boring manner or you appear very bored, you want to go, you are acting like you want to go somewhere else and you are just doing this because someone forced you to do it, then the student is not going to learn from you. Like we said, we need engaged students. We need engaged teachers who truly, who truly believe in imparting knowledge and truly believe in the success of their students. So motivation is very, very important. And then we have to do some time-consuming tasks. You know, today in the classroom, we could just prepare uh, the session, uh, lecture notes, get them printed, and then just give it out in the class. But today we have to find ex a, a way of delivering that uh, to uh, each student online. You have to send an email or you have to pre present your notes in a different way, in a more interesting way. Like, for example, I've got this PowerPoint presentation, which I'm presenting to you. If you were standing in front of your students and delivering a lecture, you can just start talking and you can write on the board. You don't have to prepare a PowerPoint presentation. So there are some time consuming activities which you have to do today, which you are not doing earlier, which makes it a little bit of a challenge for you. Third thing could be the learning activities that you have to prepare. A learning set. You can take students to a laboratory in your college and make them do some experiment or do a test. Whereas right now you can't uh, bring the students to the college. The lab cannot be used. So how do you create learning activities which makes it interesting for the students and engaging for the students and engineering and technologies and application science. So how do you bring that application element into your teaching is one more challenge that all of you are faced with. Um, I can show you uh, how a teacher does that in a very interesting way a little later. 
Another one is technical difficulties, Zoom related problems, um, connectivity issues, uh, your computer not working, the audio in your computer or the video in your computer not working um, at both ends. So you have a lot of techn technological glitches that you have to face. Another one is the isolation. Students are all stuck in their own homes. Teacher is stuck in her or his own home. Or probably some of you are going to the campus and conducting classes from there. Uh, so there is isolation and that isolation crosses its own set of uh, psychological issues. So that is one more challenge that is faced. They're not, the students are not able to meet their friends and have a good time with them, catch up over a coffee or chat with them. All this, all the fun they used to have in the classroom that is missing. So that is another challenge that teachers need to face. Now, how do you engage your students in a virtual engagement medium? Like I told you earlier, when you're not able to see them, how do you make sure, like even when I call some of my students and uh, ask them to talk, they don't talk. Uh, even today, I, I noticed that some of you, when I call you to speak with me, you're not speaking. So that engaging the teacher in a virtual conversation, uh, the, engaging the student in a virtual conversation, that is very, very important. Make your material so interesting that the student is interested to unmute and start chatting with you. That is very, very important. They, they have distractions. They probably logged into the, your training session on the laptop, but uh, they are having them, uh, their, their smartphone with them or somebody is sitting in the room with them and chatting with them. We don't know all that because the, my, my, the video is closed. So they have all sorts of distractions which you have to overcome. And then effective communication with online learners. You know, how do you communicate the key uh, messages in your lesson to the learner uh, in, a, in a structured manner, in an interesting manner, in an effective manner so that your learner is actually le getting the lessons from the, um, from the lessons you're importing and is able to then reproduce it later when you ask them questions and also when you give them the examination or an assessment, they're able to reproduce that. So that is a challenge that you teach us. Effective communication, how the message gets de delivered in an effective manner. And then the, what uh, uh, Dr. Yamuna already asked, how do we do assessments you know, in a structured manner that we ensure that they have not copied from somewhere or they have just borrowed the idea from somebody else and written it in the examination. How do we ensure that it is their own thinking and how do we ensure that, uh, you know, we uh, extract uh, answers from them, which is creative, which is innovative, which is different. All these are challenges that you face. Okay. And the final thing, the most important thing, actually, all of us do not learn in the similar manner. Some of us are tactile learners. We like to touch and feel things. Some of us like to read or we like to, um, you know, understand by seeing things. Uh, by getting words or hearing words. The third, some of us are learned through sounds um, by through our ear. We like to hear teachers say something rather than reading from a textbook. You know, a fourth one will be they're social learners. They like to learn when they're in, engaged with people and they are doing things as a group. Some people are visual learners. They learn by seeing, you know, some people are logical learners. You need, they need a, learn, a reason for understanding what is being taught to them and a reason, a logical reason for the lessons they are learning and the subjects they are learning. So how do we know this? How do we know who is a tactile learner, who is a listener, auditory learner, who is a kinesthetic learner? We can do that only through over a period of time when you're seeing them, but in a, in a classroom, in a on Zoom classroom, the only way you can do it is mix up your, your learned teaching strategy. Mix elements of everything. Show them an activity in a laboratory. You can go to the college laboratory and do an activity and show them that activity. I'm going to show you how a teacher does that in a classroom. You can do something like that. Or make them do a, a, an experiment at, at home or tell them to go out and find out something, investigate something, or uh, give them a video from which they can hear. You know. Uh, so there are different ways you can convey your uh, lessons to the, to the students so that they pick up through various senses by, by touching, by feeling, by hearing, by listening, and uh, by talking, by interacting with the, so give them group activities so that they can interact with other students in the group and come up with some project work. 
So all these different learning styles that your students are experiencing or going through, uh, you need to make them do everything. And by the way, the students respond to each activity, you will be able to understand what type of learning style they prefer. So some people will say, I like that video very much. A second person said, I like that outdoor activity you gave me. Or a third person will say that interaction I heard had with my classmates uh, in that particular project that you gave for us as a team, that was very interesting to me. So by getting the feedback from them over a period of time, you will be able to find out what type of learning style they like a lot. And it is important for you to mix it up. Uh, you mix up your teaching style. Don't do the same lecture over and over again. Don't just have a PPT, have mixed, uh, mixed lessons with mixed experiences for the students so that they learn, they'll have a more holistic learning experience. Now, some strategies on how to make your class a fun experience for your students. Before I go ahead, Dr. Yamuna already gave me a challenge. Can some of you, some, some others uh, give me some challenges that you faced? Some interesting challenge that you faced in your class when you're conducting a session. It's very important that you share it now because uh, I'm, I'm already tired of speaking on my own for the last 20 minutes. I'd like to hear some of you. Anything, even if it's a small thing, it's okay. Some small challenge or some major challenge you faced. Please unmute yourself or please use the chat box. Or if you are not able to unmute yourself, please tell me and I'll get you unmuted. Are you there? Where all are you coming from in India? I would like to know some which part of India you're all from. I can see various names here. I can see Binu Thomas, Vanita, Devendra, right? Devendra, Deepa, Joseph, Dr. Srinivasilu, Dr. Muniraj. Sir, we have a question in the chat box. Okay, let me take a look. When asking student left, okay, you mean that uh, the students are leaving when they ask them questions. Um, what I'd like you to do is, you know, sometimes what happens is uh, when they feel challenged, uh, students do leave. Um, the idea is to make the questions as disarming and simple. So go from simple to complicated. Uh, if you know there are some students in your class who are very willing to ask, uh, answer questions, then um, you can uh, ask the students who are willing to answer. And whenever any student answers a question, appreciate that person. Um, tell them it was a great idea. Uh, never uh, dis uh, never uh, um, put down any idea and never say any idea is not a good one. Even if the idea was a bad one, uh, you can say, yeah, it, it, that was an, that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it. Uh, but why don't you think about it in this manner? So instead of telling them they are wrong, uh, give them the option of correcting themselves or giving a different perspective by encouraging them to talk. I do agree that uh, students leave. So um, student, uh, yeah, now I'm starting to get some responses. Shammi James said, distraction is the biggest challenge. So my response to all of you is you become the biggest distraction. Make yourself an interesting person, you know, uh, bring in some jokes into the class, make it a fun experience for the students. If you can make engineering uh, fun, any subject you're teaching can be made fun. Include, incorporate some humor into the sessions. Uh, don't just keep uh, lecturing nonstop on a subject uh, bring in students, maybe before the class itself, uh, if you know some of the better students, uh, give them some small topics and tell them to uh, get engaged in the class by giving their response or tell them to uh, give some input from their side on that topic. Tell them to prepare in advance. So today's class, you can tell five students in my next class, I would like the five of you uh, to make a presentation on these small topics, which will be a part of the curriculum for the next class. And you guide them in the offline mode. You tell the students to contact you after the class, um, guide them on how to do the presentation. So get more students to get engaged in the teaching activity by doing little bits, you know, uh, so that then they will uh, they will also be involved in the class. And they will, once the you, 
pick students and do this three uh, three or four weeks in a row. Each week you give an activity for uh, three or four people. Over a period of time, you will get more and more students engaged. It cannot happen overnight. You cannot make people, uh, students engaged overnight. So build a relationship with them. Uh, whenever you talk to students, um, like I mentioned uh, Dr. Yamuna's name and I talked to, I mentioned Dr. Sh uh, I talked, mentioned Shami James's name. Whenever you are answering a question from somebody, mention that person's name. So like Dr. Srinivasulu said here, those students are virtually in the class. Their attention uh, also is very virtual in engagement. I agree with you, Dr. Srinivasulu. Yes, a lot of students switch on and go away or they'll be doing something else. Yeah, Neetu has said, how can we manage time for preparations? We need more time for presentation in online model. Give your suggestion. Yes. So um, I don't know, maybe smaller bites. Um, make sure that uh, don't cram too much, uh, too many topics into a particular lecture. Uh, schedule it out. Maybe um, get the student into a learning activity where, like I said, you can give a part of the textbook uh, for them to prepare and you are only giving them the highlights. Tell them to come prepare to the class with the questions. So you are giving them the highlight of the lesson, uh, the key parts of the lesson, and then students are also actively involved in the learning because uh, engineering is an application science. So there's a lot of practical part involved. There's a lot of uh, le learning involved from the outside. So tell them uh, to get an example from outside of what they uh, know about that particular topic and then we make it a discussion in the classroom. Um, I would like to say, I believe Indian uh, education system, I don't know whether it's changed today. When I studied in college, which was a long time ago, the teacher came with detailed lecture notes and they were lecturing from beginning to end of the class. Today, there are a lot of virtual resources available. Um, uh, for school children, you have uh, Baiju's and Salman uh, Salman Khan's Khan Academy. And there are so many online, Un Academy. There are, and even for college students, I'm sure there are a lot of online resources. There are a lot of things that they learn in college is explained. So I think the teacher should not take it upon themselves to bird, overburden themselves uh, with uh, teaching everything that is written in the textbook. You should, you should take the essence of the lesson and the key parts of the lesson probably should be conveyed to, to them by you through the lessons and get the student engaged and get into a dialogue with them. Tell them to ask questions from the portions that they studied and then uh, give your uh, inputs which will value add to what they've already read and studied. So analog electronics, I agree uh, that there are a lot of things uh, Dr. Sorry, K. Nishada is saying Analog electronics may be probably not easy to cover. Uh, there is no other way but to cover. So, uh, Nishada, my question to you is, uh, you know, um, are there examples? Are there uh, practical ways of uh, teaching? Because you know the subject. I don't know the subject. I have studied analog electronics many, many years back. I'm a physics graduate, so I know a little bit of electronics. Um, but that was studied 35 years ago. I don't know anything about the latest uh, in analog electronics. So I cannot, I'm not here to teach you on how to teach the subject. I'm only here to tell you how to make the subject more interesting to your students. And one of the ways, uh, one of the two of ways to get them engaged is, can you bring in practical aspects? Can you get them to do something in their house, uh, which will, uh, can be supplemented with what you can do by way of a, uh, something that you can display in your from uh, remote from your classroom instead of showing them a slide can you show them an experiment can you show an analog ex electronics experiment in a laboratory or something that you have already in the lab can you show it working and explain it to them what, what is each component doing what if there is a valve trans valve in that how is the valve working or how is that valve contributing to the entire circuitry and uh, in, in which area is analog better than digital? So, you know, bringing the practical elements, like for example, I have a niece who was studying in an engineering college in Kerala, I don't want to say where, and she was talking about cathode ray tube, and she was talking about the internal combustion engine. So I asked her, maybe I surprised her, and maybe that's why she couldn't answer. I asked her, where is a cathode ray tube used? And she couldn't tell me. And I even told her there is something in the house that uses the cathode ray tube. She couldn't connect it to the TV in her house. This was happening a few years back. Uh, LED and LCD teacher, TVs had not come at that time. 
but although she had a tv at home she couldn't connect the cathode cathode ray tube to the uh, tv in her house and she couldn't connect the internal combustion engine with the car that her father is driving so i think that practical element of engineering education should be focused on how to uh, connect what they're learning in the classroom with the world outside so when you're talking about structural engineering talk about the bridge a uh, bridge that is being made i'm going to give an example a little later you know so uh, a bridge that is being made or some building that is being made and connect that uh, with whatever is being taught in the classroom so bring in practicality bring in the real world experience um tell them to bring their own experience to the classroom and a teacher should reduce the burden on themselves to teach everything uh, don't lecture everything uh, make it a two way process let the students stumble and fall let them say the wrong things uh, let them but find out for themselves some elements of what they are studying and then the teacher helps them to correct it and value add to it instead of telling everything to them so i think i have one recommendation is to reduce the spoon feeding that you do i think indian education indian parents and indian teachers do a lot of spoon feeding to their students so we should reduce the spoon feeding and make students learn i think one of the things uh, that children see when they go overseas is and my the same niece that i spoke about she went to a foreign country to do some higher studies and there the number of hours of lecture in the in the masters program was very limited the rest of the time she was expected to go to the library and do other projects and learn things on her own so that is an element we need to bring into our classrooms to make classrooms more fun i hope i have answered some of your questions and uh, let me give you some more ideas before we so before i give answers tell me what are some of the things you are doing today to make your classroom fun for your students if i can ask uh, i already got answers from nishada and neeta and dr srinivasulu and shivatanu shami james some of you thank you dr sachidanandan uh, um sachinanandam uh, so many of you responded thank you very much i would like to hear some of you uh, uh, give some uh, inputs on how you make your class more interesting today right now what techniques are you using to make your classes more interesting because i have some prescriptions uh, some ideas which you can use uh, but before that i would like to hear your ideas very good yeah shri kumar uh, shiva kumar is saying conducting quizzes in between absolutely that's right yeah after each topic have a small quiz anybody else and quizzes are also an opportunity to teacher to understand whether the teacher understood the students understood the subject well or not so that you can elaborate on that in a little bit more detail uh, when you uh, continue your subject so that in a quiz so it's a two way thing uh, when you conduct a quiz you can understand whether the student uh, you can get a feedback from the student whether they understood uh, you the subject or not and you can give for more inputs to them any other any other please uh, i would like to get some of your some more of your ideas of what you are doing in the classroom to make it interesting for the students it will help not just me it will help the other teachers also so please collaborate on these interesting ideas that you have so that you can help each other application related teaching yes dr vetrivel is saying that absolutely i fully agree engineering is an application science you have to show application of where uh, the particular technology is being used and how it is being used i fully agree with you one more answer thank you dr shivakumar and dr vetri uh, sir shivakumar and vetrivel dr vetrivel using analogies dr sachinanand said absolutely that's right so in this particular situation this is what happened uh, so take a real life example of a real building or a real factory you know that is there in their own cities of your if you are teaching in trichy talk about a factory in trichy which the students probably have seen if you are in bangalore use an example of a bangalore based industry so use analogies from the local environment um, and yes dr r lakshmi said interaction based distractions uh, discussions um, yes use uh, uh, one of the enablers that is available in zoom i use zoom extensively uh, probably microsoft teams also has it 
I don't know whether Google Meet uh, uh, has it. I think WebEx also probably has it. So depending on whatever medium you're using, uh, you can have breakout rooms. I'm going to, I am, I'm, I am mentioning breakout rooms in my, some of the solutions offered. So, uh, so thank you to all four of you uh, for giving the inputs, uh, using analogies, using applications, uh, quizzes, and interactive discussions. Yes. So I'm going to the next slide. First of all, let us be very creative and innovative uh, in how we conduct the same old lectures that we've been doing in the uh, real-time classroom. When you bring it to the Zoom classroom, you need to bring in your creativity. You need to be very innovative about how you conducted the se sessions. So bring your creativity and innovation to the table. Uh, don't just deliver the lecture with just the subject matter deliver the subject matter in a very interesting way, in a very engaging way, so that the student will never forget the teacher or the subject. They will, if they become a teacher in the future, they will remember you and mention you in the classroom, or they will use some of the stories that you told them. Use the right tool, you know? So sometimes you need to use a quiz, sometimes you, you need to show an experiment, sometimes you need to send them out into the field and do some field study. Uh, sometimes you may have to use a simulation. So depending on what subject is being taught, use the right tool to convey your messages. So don't just deliver, you deliver have a same methodology for each lecture. That is, you all said teach, uh, students are getting distracted, students are not staying engaged, students are going away. Probably you need to ask yourself, is all my lectures sounding the same? Are all my classes the same? Can you bring in an element? So like a movie trailer, like um, the, before the movie comes, they're showing a trailer. Can you tell the students in advance, in next class, we're going to do something different, which we didn't, which we didn't do in any of the previous classes. It's a very interesting new concept I'm trying out. So they will be interested to come and get engaged in the next class. And the class after that, you're bringing one more innovation, which you did not do in any other previous classes. So in each class, you're bringing some new tool which you picked up from somewhere and you're applying it in your classroom. So for the students, they're constantly discovering new way of learning from you, new way of getting engaged with you. So they will, be, they will not get bored at the end of any class. Tell the students, I cannot keep innovating. I cannot giving new things. So part of my class will be lecturing, but in each class, I will bring in a new element which will make the class interesting for you. A third one is use a conversational language. Don't be, uh, don't be a teacher teacher. Be a, a friend teacher, you know. Use a language uh, which is more relatable to them. Um, run a conversation with your students. Uh, you are not delivering the subject to them in a very dry manner. You're uh, delivering the subject to them in a very interesting, interactive, and, you know, um, in a, in a way that the student is excited to talk with you. Uh, let them interrupt you uh, when you have a, have a joke and ask them to crack a joke in the classroom. Uh, ask them to say something fun or uh, ask them uh, how can this product be used in a, in a totally crazy way. You know, if you're showing some electronic product or if you're showing some uh, mechanical engineering product uh, in uh, experiment in the classroom, ask the student how can this uh, be used in a fun way to create something interesting, to, some, to create something that is exciting. So bring, uh, tell them to think in a wacky, creative, different way. Uh, if you're teaching robotics, can you uh, tell them to create a robot that tells uh, jokes, which are situation-based jokes. So artificial intelligence and machine learning and all these can be used to create a robot that will crack jokes, uh, which is appropriate to the situation. So, you know, you bring a fun element and a conversational element into your teaching methodology. Um, and like some of you already said, have ongoing assessments. Some of them can be marked. Some of them need not be marked, but have an ongoing assessment going Q and A. You ask, uh, tell the students to ask questions that you answer you and then you ask questions that they will answer. So there's an ongoing to and fro between you and the student and you're assessing them. So tell them, you know, some of the, and make, bring in a surprise element saying that 10% of your marks, term and marks, or 15% or 20% of the term and marks comes from the online assignments. And you will not know which of these questions are going to be um, assessed for your five term and examination. So you need to pay attention to all the questions that I ask you. 
So bring in an element of surprise uh, and put a certain percentage of the mark for online assessment, which will finally, which on which their final result will depend. So that will get more engagement and you're making your classroom interesting and engaging that way. Another thing is active engagement between the students too. You know, you can use the breakout rooms. I'm going to talk about the breakout rooms separately, but active engagement between the teacher and the students. So you give them a project work and then you help them to complete it by giving them tips. Tell them to start working on the project on their own. Then you chip in with value additions so that the actively involved in the in the entire learning process. The teacher is the students and the teachers are actively involved in the learning process. And then students also present, like I told you already earlier, give them some topic where they will come and prepare in the class, pre prepare in advance and present it to the entire classroom. And you help them with the presentations and how to prepare the presentations. So your workload is reduced and then you are applauding them and appreciating their work and value adding to what they uh, gave the what they delivered in the classroom and so your workload is in, reduced and student engagement is also increased so i already mentioned breakout rooms breakout rooms i know is available in webex and in zoom i don't know if it's available in the other platforms because i have not used them much so in the breakout rooms you can uh, take small groups of students and put them in smaller rooms where they are engaged in separate activities and then they can have a discussion among them or do a project between themselves and then come back into the main room and make a presentation. And uh, you can ask uh, the other students what they thought about the presentation. So when one group makes a presentation, after that, the other groups are supposed to, uh, you will ask questions to the other groups about that or take their feedback. So that way you have a lot of activity in the classroom. And then finally stories, your own stories. When you're teaching the subject, bring interesting stories into the classroom about uh, whether it is VLSI. You, know, you can talk about if you know, Intel, when they created a particular chip, they were trying to uh, try to achieve something and they were they hit a roadblock and then they, somebody had a brainwave. Like for example, if you, do, if you know the com famous company 3M, 3M, how did they make the Velcro? You know the story, right? One engineer of 3M was walking in the hills and some uh, seeds of the grass got stuck on his pants, on his trousers when he was walking. So he came back and he tried to check how did that uh, thing get stuck on his trouser. Uh, so he then studied the structure of the, um, of the seed of the grass and discovered how to make the Velcro strip. You know, so uh, give a practical example, a story, a real life example when a famous bridge was being made on Konkan Railway. Uh, uh, how, how, how was the structure? I was told, I'm not very sure. I was told that there is a, um, a pillar of one of the bridges on Konkan Railway, which is actually taller than Kutub Minar. I have not verified this information. Probably it is true. So how did they design that? You know, so you can give them, uh, give, uh, so you can ask a question about that. Or, you know, take some particular building in their city and ask them some questions about that building, you know, or give them a story about how that building was made. So bring stories to the classroom, make engineering a fun experience for them. Uh, this is something, so here is an experience uh, how uh, uh, this, is hap this happened either in Sweden or in Norway. People, there is an escalator there, uh, which is uh, coming out of the Metro railway station. And there is a staircase. And we all know that climbing staircase is healthy, is a healthy practice, but nobody was using the staircase. Everybody was using the escalator. So one company thought of an interesting idea. I probably some of you have seen this video, but still you can watch this. It's only a one or one and a half minute video of how they made people use the stairs. So one lady who was coming downstairs, so another person who started missing.
So that's what they did. They converted that entire stair staircase like a piano keyboard, and people started using that keyboard in order to uh, experiment with music. So something that people were not doing, they started doing when it became a fun experience. So there was gamification. There was some interesting element uh, like a music. And it was fun for people to climb the staircase. So that is how you can make your classroom interesting. So have a game plan, you know, your entire course syllabus, you have a syllabus plan. You can decide in advance what experiment or what activity I'll bring for delivering each of these. You can collaborate, the teachers in the department can collaborate and bring some interesting ideas. Have a game plan on how to deliver that entire series of lectures. Uh, if there is 20 credit hours or 30 credit hours for that course, how to make it uh, an exciting experience, a value-adding value experience, and a fun experience for the student. Record the classrooms. You know, the entire series of lectures that you do, record them in advance, and so that uh, you, later on you can play it back and find out what the students liked and what they didn't like a lot. You know, so record it. The third one is gamify, bring fun element like the staircase that you just show, Ajay, you saw. Uh, gamify your entire classroom. Fourth one is the quality of the teaching. You as a teacher, exciting the students, they're delivering the lecture with your knowledge, with your capabilities, and bringing as much fun and as much interaction into the classroom. And finally, the quality with which you deliver the session. At the end of the session, the student is going away with a great learning experience and saying, wow, fantastic. I love this. I love this teacher. My teacher really does uh, have, knows how to deliver this lesson in a very exciting and interesting way. That is a message they're going away with. That is how you should be able to plan each lecture to make it a fun experience for your students. Here is one teacher. His name is Walter Levin. He's go I'm going to show you. This is a bigger video. I cut it down to one or two minutes. He's teaching the principle of con conservation of energy. And he's putting his own life at stake by teaching while he's teaching conservation of energy. See? He's using a wrecking ball. He's using a wrecking ball and he shows that the wrecking ball is a very heavy piece of metal. He breaks a thick piece of glass and now he says what, now he's going to tell you what he's going to do. I think all of you have studied uh, physics in school and college, you know that there's potential energy and kinetic energy and the conservation at any point of time, the total of conservation, uh, potential and kinetic energy is equal. Uh, so he's going to prove that with an experiment in the classroom. The, class. the students are watching him in the classroom. And I'm going to hold this object at my chin. And I cannot move any further back, so there's no cheat here. I'm going to release it right from my chin here. You realize, as you have just seen, <laughs> that the slightest push and this will be my last lecture. <laughs> and no book signing afterwards. <laughs> and I have to tell you something. I couldn't sleep all night. <laughs> I'm going to close my eyes. I don't want to see it. And I'm going to count down from three to zero. But if my hands shake a little, and if I give it a little push, then of course it can come back and it may want to go higher than this. Three, two, one, zero. So he, so he put his own life at stake and he put a wrecking ball, a very heavy metal ball, he released it from near his face and he said if the conservation the principle of conservation of momentum of energy is true then the ball will not come and hit my face so obviously uh, the principle of conservation of energy is true and the ball did not hit his face but when you teach the subject in this manner the student will never forget the subject again in its in his or her life it's a very and a public demonstration, a very uh, dramatic dem demonstration of the subject. So that is how you can make the class interesting for your students. This is an example of a very famous or infamous flyover in Cochin. We call it the Palarivatam flyover. 
which was constructed spending hundreds of crores within a few months of uh, making it it got spoiled it was structurally damaged and the bridge has again been closed again a few hundred more uh, crores have to be spent in reconstructing the bridge it is in the heart of cochin there is a second bridge the next junction from this bridge that bridge also been constructed there is a metro railway line going above that bridge and there's a uh, road below that now they they now the, the height of the bridge has been restricted because the designer who planned the bridge did not take the metro bridge into consideration uh, the metro duct into consideration when he was designing this bridge so only build, only transports of a particular height can go over the bridge so these are two stupid mistakes made while designing these bridges and that is resulting in crores worth of revenue loss so can we ask students when they are in the class how can such a thing be stopped get yeah, can they have practical solutions to solve problems like this or take this example if you take a vlsi chip you know in the design what can uh, what can be done in order to make extract more work from that chip or in order to reduce the heat uh, being built up in that chip or the kind of logic that can be used in the construction can they give an example of from real life where some company solved some problem the third example this was a demolition of a building which took place in cochin uh, i'm sure buildings are getting demolished all over and you can see the smoke of that building at the next the building next door which uh, which is not supposed to be damaged the smoke from this building the dust from this building is going into that building probably if this building is not demolished properly a part of that structure will fall on the building next door so we can ask them you know when you are constructing the building itself what uh, precautions can we use in order to ensure that in case this building needs to be damaged in future uh, to be demolished in future how can we ensure it can be done with maximum safety so ask students to work on their ideas on how will they place the uh, you know explosive so that the building will fall down horizontally and will not fall down uh, to a side you know or vertically so you know fall vertically and not horizontally or you know take a building like burj khalifa so what are the structural elements or design elements that have gone into that because it's such a tall structure the tallest structure in the world today how do they make sure that the crushing weight of the upper stories does not come on the lower stories so what could be some of the design elements ask the teachers the students to work on a project like this and think on how this building was constructed uh, chemical factory maybe you are making a small chemical factory and then you want to increase the capacity of the factory 10 times uh, you cannot just linearly increase everything because there are issues structurally or you can the chemicals that are used in the factory cannot be stored in uh, larger quantities due to various factors so ask them you know people the students may design a larger factory in a linear fashion so probably you have to tell them we can't design it in a linear fashion and you have to bring in other design elements into it when we scale up so multiple design problems can be brought into the discussion uh, so that the student is putting their thinking cap on and uh, collaboratively uh, learning the subject with the teacher the teacher is making the classroom exciting by giving real world uh, experience to the students when they go out as indige engineers uh, the kind of problems they will solve in real life if they are trying to solve that in the classroom itself so this is one way you can make the subject very interesting for them uh, another thing you know that we call it death by powerpoint in business a lot of people show powerpoint presentations i think i'm sure in the lectures also uh, you use a lot of powerpoint presentations did any of you see any slide so far in my presentation which had many many lines of text like this did you see any slide like this in my presentation so far yes or no you can tap at uh, type yes or no in the chat box no thank you thank you dr shivkumar mr shivkumar thank you kiran kumar thank you yes i intentionally do that because i know this kind of text is very very boring so my suggestion thank you everyone i can see lot of people saying no 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 thank you very much kind of you to say so so because i am i i make lot of presentations regularly to people and i know it is not a good idea to make presentations of this fashion and therefore i always make sure my slides are not packed with text i always ensure that 
texts are, you know, this is a simpler side. Uh, they say that you should keep your slides very simple. Uh, just the summary, either one word or one concept or one line should be presented on one slide or two, three lines at the most. And you are the person, the main presenter. You are the one who's conveying the subject to them. So don't put every, if you're explaining a theorem to them, maybe the theorem alone can be written on the slide or probably even not even that, you can read it out or tell them to read the theorem from their textbook, uh, but you are explaining the theorem to them with practical ideas and with interesting examples. So keep, I'm gonna, this guy, I love this guy a lot. He's no longer with us. He died a few years back. He is the founder of uh, uh, Apple computers, Steve Jobs. Look at how he makes a presentation. He's a master in making presentation. And look at how he makes a presentation. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. And Sorry. And Apple has been well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. In 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple. It changed the whole computer industry. In 2001, we introduced the first iPod. And it didn't, just, it didn't just change the way we all listen to music. It changed the entire music industry. Well, today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. So, three things. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod, a phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. Today, Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. And here it is. <laughs> he's, a doctor, uh, he's a master presenter, and he uses a sense of humor. He brings excitement into the presentation. He brings fun into the presentation. He brings suspense into the presentation. So that is what he uses. Every once in a while. So, so I like to... Um, I'm, I'm, uh, Dr. Yamuna, I think we are almost at 12 o'clock. Can I take five more minutes to explain one more concept before I close? Will the teachers be ready to wait for five more minutes? Sure, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So let us just go ahead. Um, so this is how you can make your presentations very, very interesting. Um, make your PowerPoint presentations as simple, like uh, one teacher, uh, doc, Dr. Mr. Prasanna said, KISS is a short form for keep it so, so simple, stupid, or keep it short and simple. Yes, that's right. It's a fundamental principle for all presentations. 
So make your principal presentations. Uh, the, your presentation should be supporting you. You are not supporting the presentation. The presentation is secondary to you. You as the teacher are coming up with innov innovative ideas and exciting new ideas. And the presentation is only a secondary thing that you're using to add uh, to your presentation. You are the main value adder. That is what you all teachers need to remember. And finally, I'm going to go to a concept called design thinking. Design thinking is thinking and looking at all design, whether it's uh, your subject matter design or product design or service design, thinking, uh, thinking from the customer's point of view. And for all of you, your students are your customer. And your, uh, the, your product is the lessons that you're teaching, the subject that you're teaching in the class. So use design thinking methodologies to deliver a high quality um, lecture or a high quality uh, cl class session in the classroom, which students will remember for the rest of their life. Steps involved in design thinking is empathize. Empathizing means a deep understanding. All of you said that the students are distracted, the students are not engaged, the students are not listening, they're switching on the video and going away. So ask the students, why are they doing that? Why is my class not interesting to you? How can I make my class more interesting to you? Look at the class you sit at. Today you are a student. So what did I do as a teacher to make your class, to make, make the class engaging and interesting for you? You know, so think about that. Empathize with, the, uh, with your customer. Second is define the problem. So this subject has to be delivered and it's uh, application science. So how can I deliver this application science subject in an exciting manner? Define that. And then ideate, sit with the students or some students, a group of students or sit with our teachers and brainstorm and find out potential solutions of how to deliver the session in a very exciting manner and develop a solution. Then prototype it, run a demo pilot session, maybe call a few teachers in the college and run a pilot session of that, you know, find out whether this was more interesting than my other normal lectures. And then pro once you prototype it, then make it fine tune it and find create the de final deliver deliverable product and then deliver it in the classroom and then keep getting feedback from the students and find out if you, do, you don't ask them for feedback, find out if in my normal lecture classes, only 20% of the students are responding. When I started delivering my lecture in a different manner, are 25% or 30% or 40% of my students are responding now? Are more percentage of students responding now? Are uh, you know, more students engaged in my classes now? So this way you can keep changing uh, the way you deliver your lectures and that way make it more interesting for your students and exciting for your students so that you will have a classroom full of students who are interested to hear you talk to them. So that's, I'm going to show you one last video, another short video to close my lecture. Des this is a design thinking uh, uh, example. Design thinking is an innovative methodology which can be utilized by large organizations to design experiences to delight their customers. Here's an example of how it works. An Australian supermarket chain wanted to design a unique in-store experience. We interviewed and observed shoppers over a considerable period. Customers wanted to feel more connected with the suppliers of their produce and an in-store experience they couldn't find elsewhere. One winning idea was an in-store milk dispenser with old-style glass milk bottles. Customers filled the bottles with single-origin, high-quality milk. With details of the cows and farms that produced it, and assurance they received a fair price. If we'd asked what customers wanted, they'd probably have said cheaper produce. But by empathising, living and observing, we developed a popular experience that not only delights customers, but gives the store a unique edge by connecting with shoppers' hearts and minds. In summary, people don't know what they want. Using design thinking helps understand their needs, gains and pains to design experiences that will absolutely delight customers and build lasting loyalty. Okay, so this is, um, so that is a design thinking idea. Many of the, many more design thinking ideas are um, uh, available online. Uh, you can see them. Uh, so many teachers are not role models. They don't listen to good talks. Oh, 
So this is from someone. Okay, so teachers, that's a message for all of you. So teachers need to be role models. And um, I always ask all teachers and all students this, how many of you read, you know, other than your subject matter? So how many of you regularly read books? I regularly read, I regularly read different subjects to value add to my portfolio of knowledge so that when I go to a classroom, I make the classroom sessions more interesting. And teachers need to constantly keep reading sub stuff other than their subject matter to value add to their repository of knowledge to make the classes more exciting for their students. And you all need these three things, enthusiasm, empathy, and energy. Deliver your classes with the highest amount of energy. Be empathetic with the students' needs and show enthusiasm in the classroom so that the students, students are excited by your presence there. So that is my message to all of you. Uh, I think one more last slide. Yeah, so you need to realize this, that we are appealing to the brain of uh, another human being and the, the brain has got emotional elements and analytical elements and instinctive elements. You have to appeal to all these three aspects of the human brain. And these are the reasons why humans live. They need certainty in their life. They need variety in their life, significance, love and connection, contribution. They want to make contribution and they want to have growth in their life. In what way are you as a teacher contributing to these areas? If you can contribute to the growth of your students in this manner, then you will be applauded, appreciated, and remembered as great teachers. That's my message to you. So a leader is someone who knows the way, knows the way, and shows the way. Thank you. That was my lecture. Thank you very much. So if you have any feedback to give right now, I would like to hear that. Otherwise, you can give it in the feedback, uh, the form given by the college. Appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to me. Sir, it yes. was a very interactive session. Thank, Thank you. you for brushing up the strategies for making the online classes interactive and engage the students most effectively. The videos that you demonstrated were very interesting and such methods will definitely hold the attention of the students. I believe all the participants who would have by now felt the urge and necessity to present their classes in the most effective manner by bringing fun and excitement into their duty. Thank you once again for coming over a very short notice and handling the session in a very effective manner. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Yamuna, and thank you, Amal Jyoti College, for this act for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye then. Bye.